In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. Lift your mouth to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. Oh, truly, Lord, it is right and just to give you thanks mm -hmm. in all things. As we explore the, the depth and many dimensions of your love, as we explore the meaning of the Eucharist, the good gift that you give us, the act of thanksgiving by which we respond to your gift, we ask that you may guide us with the power of your spirit. May we be faithful to the word of your son and may everything we say and do begin with your inspiration, be guided and supported and sustained by the power of your spirit and come to fulfillment in your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're getting close to the to the home stretch. And uh, I hope it's going well. Um, half of me says, I don't want this to end. I'm having fun. The other half of me says, come on, let's get back to let's get back to everything else. So I guess that's kind of normal to, yeah. to experience that division. What I was thinking to do today is to uh, go launch from our considerations that we've had of uh, b both God's love, the, the uh, self-emptying of God's love, and particularly self-emptying in Christ, and the self-emptying of Christ in his sacrifice that is continued and shared among us in the Eucharist, and our response to that. And yesterday we talked about um, the Eucharist as summit and source of Christian life and mission, and we unpacked that a little bit. It seems now that the next logical step is to take that summit and source, Christian life and mission, into what does that have to say about our prayer? Because if we are anything as committed disciples of Christ, if we are anything as specifically dedicated religious to Christ, prayer is at the center. And so what does Eucharist have to do with our prayer? There is an old principle saying that has been attributed to a number of fathers of the church, uh, maybe some mothers of the church, uh, theologians, that I've read a fair amount about and I haven't really been able to get to the origin of it and it's even expressed in different ways, but the, the nifty expression of it in Latin, I always like Latin, um, uh, sometimes because it actually says things very, very clearly. But this Latin expression, you may have heard it, lex orandi, lex credendi. Now those are four words. Lex orandi. Lex means law. But it also means order. It means the way, the way we do things. So lex orandi means the way we pray. 
Lex credendi means the way we believe. And that's been understood traditionally in both directions. And uh, I can remember professors sort of arguing about this. Uh, does the way that we pray give birth to the way that we believe? Or is the way that we pray dependent on the way that we believe? In other words, does the way that we believe give birth to the way that we pray? Or is there a reciprocal relationship there? Which is what I think is generally intended. That the way that we pray, how we pray influences how we believe. How we believe influences how we pray. Now, if you detect a little something of the chicken and egg um, mm -hmm. conundrum there, you're absolutely right. Which comes first? Well, look at it one way. The egg gives rise to the chicken. Look at it another way. The chicken brings forth the egg. The way that we pray, well, the way that we believe gives rise to the way that we pray. The way, but the way that we pray strongly influences the way that we believe. We pray the way that we believe, but we believe the way that we pray. If we are given a prayer by the church, for example, we, our faith is formed by that prayer. Our faith is formed by the Lord's Prayer. Our, but the Lord's Prayer is born out of the faith of the church. It is the faith of the church, the faith of the apostles, that remembered the words of Jesus and embodied them in the Lord's Prayer. In fact, you know, we have two different versions of the Lord's Prayer. Both similar, but in St. Matthew's Gospel, we have it the way that we usually say it, right? Yes. In St. Luke's Gospel, we have a condensed version of it. Interesting to ask the question, what really happened between what Jesus said and Matthew's writing it down and Luke's writing it down? Did Luke come closer to the original and Matthew expanded on it? Did Matthew come closer to the original and Luke expanded on it? Or was the original something in different words that then the apostles and the early community took to heart and from that taking to heart Matthew's gospel was written in a particular context for a particular people and Luke's gospel was written in a different context for different people. probably something of all of the above. The point is, we have there Jesus' words given to us by Matthew. We have Jesus' words given to us by Luke, and they're different. Or we have Jesus as seen through the faith of Matthew and Matthew's community and Jesus as seen through the faith of Luke and Luke's community. And there's a different flavor to each of them. But our faith is, and this is where infallibility and inerrancy whatever the difference between the two of them is, infallibility or inerrancy. And there is a difference, but that doesn't... In other words, 
the, the, the authenticity of the Gospels, the inerrancy of the Gospels, doesn't necessarily go back to the exact wording. It does go back to Matthew is an, a faithful reflection of what Jesus said. Luke is a faithful reflection of what Jesus said. Now, that's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit guides, you know, we've got 2,000 years between then and now. Exactly 2,000 years ago, Jesus was a 19-year-old teenager, or more likely a 24, 25-year-old young man. Um, and it's interesting, it's a, it, 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 it could be fascinating to talk about, because we've got some evidence of it, what Jesus might have been doing during those years. But nonetheless, we've got 2,000 years here. The Holy Spirit, this is what tradition means. The Holy Spirit has been active throughout all of that time. Not changing anything, but unfolding. Unfolding. Making clearer. Making connections. Making connections between what we have received from the past the faith of the apostles, the faith that we've inherited, and how that can be applied right now. And how that faith received from the apostles was applied in the 5th century, the 13th century, the 16th century, the 19th and 20th century, and the 21st century are all different, but united in continuity. And, you know, and I think this is, just as a little aside, there is so much controversy about um, Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. And we, you know, we read some horrible polemics, actually, on both sides of that controversy. If you haven't read them, if you haven't seen them, you're lucky, don't. But uh, the fact is that um, if you take one step back, um, all of the popes through the 20th century and the 19th century and before have all been in continuity in the essence, even though there may have been uh, some very divergent tangents that they may have um, uh, emphasized, but they have all been in, I would, I would venture to use the word perfect continuity. Even scoundrels like, which one was it, Benedict the Ninth? who was probably the worst pope in all of history. And he lived, I think, in the 10th or 11th century, back when the papacy was trying to be controlled by various noble Roman families. Anyway, that's getting off on a tangent anyway. But it, it kind of just, I'm, I'm using it to sort of, uh, and, and let's come back to this lex orandi, lex credendi. Thing, the relationship between how we believe, which is always unfolding and enriching, and enriching I think is a good word here, and um, how we pray, which is also unfolding. Now, there are two other lexes or lejas here uh, that I've come up with, because lex orandi, the way of praying, and lex credendi, the way of believing, are related to 
what I might call lex vivendi, which is the way of living, and lex agendi, the way of doing. So both how we pray and how we believe obviously is intimately related to how we live and what we do. And you may remember yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the day before, I was talking about the distinction between life and activity. That uh, uh, we have to do what we need to do to keep ourselves alive and healthy, but we keep our, ourselves alive and healthy not just to be alive and healthy, we keep ourselves alive and healthy in order to do what we do. But if our only concern is to do what we do, if we get lost in our work, it may be that our health will suffer. If we get lost in taking care of ourselves, we're not going to do anything worthwhile. So you need the balance of the two. Same thing with our life in relation to God and in, in relation to the world. That um, the way that we believe and the way that we pray has to influence the way that we keep our spiritual lives, our life in relationship with God, alive and well which in turn has to unfold in our mission, uh, how we evangelize, how we bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, into our world. And conversely, how we bring the good news of Jesus into our world, think about this, how we conduct our mission also influences how we keep ourselves healthy spiritually as well as physically. And those two influence how we pray, both directions. How we pray influences them, how we live and how we, what we do, and what, how we live and what we do influences how we pray. And that all influences how we believe. Are you confused enough yet? Yes. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry. But what what but you know what, what I'm trying to get to, and if I were Bishop Sheen, of course, I'd have my blackboard mm -hmm. and that little angel that would erase it when I need it. But uh, you know, what I'd probably do is just draw how we pray, how we believe, how we live and what we, how we do what we do, and put lines, arrows, between all of them, because they all influence each other. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So picture those four words with arrows going in every which direction among them. All right. Now put that whole complex thing a little bit on the side, because now we're going to draw another arrow from that. The prayer of the church. And how does the prayer of the church, liturgical prayer, in other words, relate to our own personal prayer? How does what we do at Mass relate to how we pray in the quiet of our rooms? So I'd like to look at there are two elements, actually, to the prayer of the church, liturgical prayer. One is the Eucharist and sacraments. The other is the liturgy of the hours. I'm not going to devote too much attention to the liturgy of the hours, but I will a little bit. But the Eucharist and sacraments, Eucharist in particular, sacraments, and I could go on and on about this, but that will be a, a footnote that will be left un said, uh, all of the sacraments relate to the Eucharist, in some way coming from it, in some way leading to it. Okay. But in the Eucharist, I'd like to ask a question about our prayer when we gather to celebrate Mass. To whom do we pray? 
The easy answer is, of course, God. And that's not a wrong answer, because God is one. But as Christians, the answer needs to be a little bit more refined, because God is Trinity. And the second person of the Blessed Trinity became one of us, and he's the one who suffered and died and rose and who gave us the Eucharist. And he promised his spirit, and we can never neglect the spirit. So to whom do we pray? If you've ever really listened to the prayers of the Mass, you, you have the answer deep in your heart. In the liturgy, we pray only to God the Father. We pray to God the Father. We do not pray to Jesus Christ, with two or three exceptions. One of them is that prayer for peace, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles. The other one is the Kyrie, Lord have mercy. And the third one is the Lamb of God, on your stay. Kyrie and on your stay are litanies. They're not really of the normal prayer type of the Mass. They're more like chants, songs. Uh, the prayer for peace is kind of an exception. Praying to Jesus right before we receive his body and blood. And so I'm, I'm going to leave that aside. Generally, we pray to God the Father. All of the collect prayers, those variable prayers, all the Eucharistic prayer at the heart of the Mass, and the various other prayers in the Mass, all are to God the Father. In Jesus Christ. So we are praying to God the Father as members of the body of Christ. In other words, at the Mass, what we are doing is articulating, giving voice to the prayer of Jesus to his Father. That's what's happening at the Mass. It's not that we're praying to Jesus. We are praying uh, as members of his body. We are praying not even just with him. We are praying in him. So we are in him. Uh, it's an interesting thought because we often try to think of Jesus coming into us. But the real movement in the Mass is we are in Jesus, offering his prayer and therefore offering his sacrifice to God the Father. So. Think about that. When, when we are celebrating Mass, our prayer is in Jesus to the Father. Now, all of this is made possible by the Holy Spirit, guided, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I think those two words are kind of important, guided by and empowered by sort of like the Holy Spirit serves as both the engine of the car and the steering wheel. Um, so it is a Trinitarian action. In the Mass we are actually in Jesus participating in the life of the Trinity. And when we say life of the Trinity, that's not an abstract concept. That is God's outpouring of love, the Father's outpouring of love to the Son, the Son's response to the, uh, to the Father's love, that is the power and the love of the Holy Spirit. So we're being caught, at the Mass we're being caught up in that, 
relationship of the three divine persons with one another. So, you kind of see that um, a window, maybe more properly a doorway, into the life of God is being opened to us in the Mass. Uh, in a sense, Jesus is there. We are, he is inviting us, he is saying, welcome, come in. We've got something really, really exciting happening here. Uh, this is the life of God. This is the only thing that, th this is what constitutes all that is, is this life of God. The whole universe and you and I are only just a little tiny part of that. And somehow or other, and our tradition says it's because of disobedience, it's because of self-centeredness, jealousy, um, on the part of some element of God's creation that we, that we call angels, that there is a disruption in that, that it's not what God really intended this alienation because well, symbolically at least Luther, or not Luther uh, Lucifer the um, uh, the prince of demons shall we say um, said no to God used the gift of free will to say no and because of that no We have been in a state of alienation that God is trying his darndest to overcome. You know, God wants us united with him to fulfill his creation, to be able to pour out his love in us. God wants us united with him far more than we could ever want to be united to God. Now, there's only one thing that I can say about that. Wow. All of it comes to a focus here when we celebrate the Mass. All of everything that God is and has done comes to a focus, a focal point in the Mass. And then for us, when we go through that door, following <coughs> our celebration of the Eucharist, our communion, it goes out to the world. We are the ones who take it in some way into the places where this grace of God would not be if we were not there. Uh, kind of boggles the mind, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Remember I started way back in the first lecture talking about that book by J.B. Phillips, um, Your God is Too Small. Mm -hmm. I read the book. I think Phillips' God is too small, too. <laughs> Anything that you have to say about God is too small. Uh, you know, once we get started thinking in, in these terms, it seems to me it would not be very hard to go into mystical ecstasy. But if we go into mystical ecstasy and stay there, we're not doing much good for anybody. Probably not even for ourselves. So, you know, even St. Teresa of Avila, you know, God had his way of shoving her out of mystical ec ecstasy. But it was nice. So to whom do we pray? We don't pray to God as the Trinity. We pray within the Trinity 
to God the Father in union with the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of summed up in the Eucharistic prayer, where we are talking, where we are speaking uh, directly to the Father in the name of uh, Jesus the Son and focusing on the mystery of the cross, his sacrifice and the resurrection, and the way that he continued that cross, at, the, at the, that sacrifice, uh, making it present through the Eucharist. So that gets us into kind of how we pray. And I'm going to use Remember, I kind of like to use a few Latin words there. Mm -hmm. Well, here I'm going to use a couple of Greek words that are my favorites. And I can't talk about liturgy without using these Greek words and saying, you know, it's kind of good at least to have them in your vocabulary, at least your passive vocabulary, because this also speaks of the dynamic of our prayer. Those two words are anamnesis, and epiclesis. And amnesis and epiclesis. Now, giving you time to write them down if you want to. <laughs> uh, but an amnesis means remembrance. Actually, the, the, you know, the Greeks sometimes when they want to emphasize something, they say what something is not. And we're all familiar, maybe some of us as we get older, too familiar with amnesia. Mm -hmm. Amnesia is forgetting, right? <clears throat> That's from the Greek word, amnesia. An, A-N, is a Greek word for a, a strong negation the exact opposite. So when, when you hear a word that is derived from Greek and it begins with an, a-n, you know that uh, it's the exact opposite of what the rest of the word is. So an amnesis, unforgetting, <clears throat> the impossibility of forgetting, the remembrance of that which we cannot forget because our life depends on it. That's how we start. Remember the, the opening dialogue that we, that we start our prayer with. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Why? We give thanks for what God has done. We remember with thanksgiving. With thanks and praise we remember what our God has done. That actually Goes, that structure of prayer goes back to the ancient Jewish forms of prayer, too. Uh, but in the preface, the preface of the Eucharistic prayer is to give thanks to, for some specific aspects, perhaps, of what God has done. Now, the second word, epiclesis, also comes from two Greek words, uh, kale, which means to call, to call upon, and epi, which means down. So epiclesis is calling on the power of the Holy Spirit, calling upon God to do now for us what God did in the past. If you've ever been to a Seder or a Jewish celebration of the Passover, you know that one of the central prayers and movements of the Seder is to recall the story of the liberation from Egypt and to pray that what God did in the past, God will do now. And every Seder ends with the hope that next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem. Not just to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or to go and visit Jerusalem, but that next year, the promise of God in the past, the liberation of God for his people will be fulfilled 
here and now in our midst, so that we will have in our midst the new Jerusalem. The Jews are still hoping for the fulfillment of that. Uh, we believe, of course, that in Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So, Epiclesis, uh, why and how does the transformation of the bread and wine happen? Is it because the priest says magic words as an incantation? You know, the bread and wine are changed because the priest says, this is my body, this is my blood. In a sense, that's true, but we have to look behind, behind that. And the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ happens because the church is praying for it. The church, as the body of Christ, is asking God to send his spirit to transform these gifts. That's why, before the institution narrative, before we tell what Jesus did at the Last Supper, we always pray that the God will send the Fa God the Father will send his Holy Spirit upon these gifts to make them holy, to transform them into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So that prayer is an essential component of the uh, of, of, of the Mass, of the liturgy, of, of the Eucharist. Now, sometimes, and some theologians would say, well, you know, all that's really necessary is that the priest, had, who has the power, say the words, this is my body, and it becomes the body of, of Jesus. Um, many theologians, myself included, would take issue with that. Some said, you know, if a priest, if a renegade priest would go into a bakery, <laughs> and say, back in those days, hoc est enum corpus meum, you know, that the bishop would then have to buy up all the bread in the bakery and be sure that it was reverently consumed because it would become the body of Christ. Uh, that's nonsense. It doesn't happen just because the priest says it. It happens because the priest says it in the context of that remembrance of what Jesus did and in the context of praying for what Jesus did to happen now. So it doesn't happen just because the words are spoken. It happens because we have the whole context of the prayer of the church being brought and brought to bear here. And God answers the prayer of Christ, which is the prayer of the church. But now, in the Mass, and traditionally in the, in the uh, Eucharistic prayer, there are two epiclesis. One is an epiclesis that prays for the Holy Spirit to come to transform these gifts of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That's clear enough. But there is a similar epiclesis after we recall what Jesus did at the Last Supper, after the consecration of the gifts, in which we pray that through the reception of this consecrated bread and wine, through the reception of the body and blood of Christ, the people the community, the assembly, the body of Christ may become what we receive, may be nourished by this. So it's, it's, a, it's a, an action that unfolds. It's not just the presence of Jesus here in the bread and wine. It's not just that Jesus is there. It is that we pray also that through our reception of Jesus, we may become our, according to our splendid central liturgical principle, we may become what we eat. And so that's how the church prays. Now, 
our prayer throughout the rest of our lives. When we go out from here, we still pray. We pray the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, if you pray the full Liturgy of the Hours, you're praying at least five times a day. It's interesting, Muslims have uh, a call to prayer five times a day, too. Uh, I've read some spiritual writers say that if you don't do something formally to acknowledge God's presence every couple of hours, you will become forgetful. So every few hours, the church calls us by the liturgy of the hours. We don't always follow that call quite as literally as maybe we should. But every few hours, the church calls us formally to some kind of prayer to acknowledge the presence of God with us and the action of God that we celebrated in the Eucharist. Uh, the presence of God isn't just, I hope it's kind of clear by now, the presence of God isn't just, oh, God is here, that's nice, thank you for being here, God, keep up the good work and help me whenever I need you. And um, sometimes when we say, when we say, help me whenever I need you, uh, implied in that is when I, when I don't think I need you, mind your own business, <laughs> leave me alone. No, every few hours we've got to involve ourselves back into the life of God or let him bring us back into his life. And then, then we, our whole life can be a prayer. So our whole life isn't automatically a prayer just because <clears throat> we feel good about God. Our whole life can be a prayer when we consciously begin to reinforce that. Uh, having some way, whether it's the liturgy of the hours or something else, but uh, every few hours in some way calling us back to the realization that we are living in union with the Trinity. We are living in union with that dynamic relationship of, of self-emptying love that constitutes the Trinity, constitutes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are, we are now drawn into that, but what we shall be will be the unbelievable fulfillment of that. probably enough to uh, give us a little something to think and pray about as we are uh, in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and uh, uh, continuing to, to thank God for what he has done and to seek that we may continue to cooperate with what he has done. Are there any thoughts and questions to uh, um, to conclude our our talk this evening. Many. <laughs> Many. Oh my. I always talk about it as um, it was that holy orders was conferred on the priest. Mm -hmm. And that was principally to give him the the power to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood mm -hmm. of Christ. But uh, am I hearing you saying that may be partially true, but it's not the whole picture. Yeah, and I like the way that you put that, because a lot of people see it, oh, well, no, that's not true, this is true. Mm -hmm. No, I, uh, what, what I try very often to do is to, to say, yes, that's true, but you know, just looking at it as, as a power thing mm -hmm. is, very inadequate. And if we step back, we see uh, a whole relational dynamic going on. You know, it's sort of like you can, you can reduce a marriage to power, can't you? But 
if marriage is looked at only in terms of who has the power over whom in what way, where does the husband have power over the wife and where does the wife have power over the husband, yeah, that may be true, but if it's looked at only as a power thing, um, you have to say that's probably not much of a marriage. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a much broader, multifaceted relationship going on there in many different ways, then you begin to get a better feel for uh, wow, there is something really happening here. And at some point, marriage as a sacrament is a is a sign, is a is a manifestation of the way that Christ relates to the church and the way that God relates to us and we are called to relate to God. So, you know, um, what I'm what I'm basically trying to do is broaden our horizons and see if uh, maybe maybe even at our advanced age to give us the tools to think more deeply about what we're doing in these last years to prepare ourselves to let God reveal himself fully to us when we step into eternity. And uh, once again, wow. You <laughs> made the Mass seem to be more meaningful. I find it more meaningful now that you explain many of the things. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's my aim. Yeah. And then, Father, when priests celebrate Mass but they don't have a congregation there, they may not have anybody there, uh, but uh, you're saying that it's the prayer of the faithful when the priest is celebrating the Mass? In the some priest. way, the whole church is there, even if it's, I, I guess one could use the word virtually. Mm -hmm. you know. um, in some way, the whole church is represented. Now, the old rules were that the priest actually always had to have an altar server, mm -hmm. unless unless there were some dire emergency. Mm -hmm. But that there always had to be provision for at least one person there to represent the rest mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. And that was sometimes taken with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it still. I happened to come upon a priest at, at, the, at our house of prayer some years back. Um, I was going into the chapel there and he was uh, basically saying Mass according to the Tridentine Rite. Um, uh, and he was very obviously making it his own private devotion mm -hmm. because his body language was sort of annoyed that somebody had walked in on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I slipped out, but I kind of thought, mm, that was sad. Yeah.